said oh man that's just a beautiful song to open up with shouting to the lord welcome to anderson ferry church of christ and it's <laughs> spring amen yeah we're getting there we got our yellows and our other bright colors some of us are still wearing flannels though <laughs> gotta move forward remember we we sprung forward so let's get into spring here Annette. it's just and it's been a crazy week. We go from freezing cold, super hot on Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, shiver me timbers. The wind's blowing on us. So let's just keep, have, Lord, just keep bringing the spring to us now. But without the harsh weather, we would not appreciate this beautiful day today, would we? Uh-uh. So with that, let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just praise and thank you because you are a loving Father. And Father, we want your will to be done in our lives and in this church body. And Father, help us to be listeners to the Holy Spirit who indwells in us. Help us to be into your word as the elders are encouraging us to do this year, to really, really set aside the computer, set aside the controller on the TV, and read your word. As we read it together, Father, we ask that your spirit move us. Move us to those who need help, who need to know you and to learn about 
you being Lord and Savior of their lives. And that we can share about the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to set us free. And Father, help us to watch out for each other, to love each other deeply, to overlook the things that we do to offend one another, and that Jesus can be lifted up, not just this morning, but on a daily basis. For it is in his name we pray, amen. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the mighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Ain't no rock, no rock, I'm gonna cry in my place. As long as I'm alive, I'll glorify his holy name. Ain't no rock, no rock, I'm gonna cry in my place. As long as I'm alive, I'll glorify his holy name. surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God.
From now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. to remember. We have the four Gospels which speak of the good news of Jesus Christ. We read of the miracles he did, changing water into the wine, healing the lepers who came to him, healing the little girl from a distance when her daddy came and pleaded for her life. In person, he raised the young girl from the deathbed. He calms the sea with just a word. He gives living water to the woman at the well, whom the rest of the town had rejected. To the blind, he gives sight. But for the spiritual leaders, they could not see with their hearts. He is the bread of life who comes down to me, and whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. What does this mean for you and me 2,000 years later? 
the wine. He is interested in the everyday affairs of life that we go through. The healing of the lepers, the little girl from a distance. Our healer has not forgotten us. He heals the broken heart and the broken mind. The storms in our lives, as they blow and overtake us, we yell out, and he comes walking across the troubled seas. And he speaks into our heart, and the calmness comes. The woman at the well, the outcast of society, and many times we are outcasts. Outcasts from our family, friends, and work. Many times we are looked down upon. But he gives us living water. And he refreshes the parched deserts of our lives. For the blind man, he opens our spiritual eyes. So that we can see. God is good. And he loves us. He pursues us. Looking for us. Like the prodigal children we are so many times. He chases us down. He sees us stumbling back. And God, you, you, you'll never take me back. I've screwed up again and again. And he goes, uh uh, let's get the cloak, let's get the fattened calf, let's get on with this. I love you. I love you through my son. And he invites us, after he has pursued us, clothed us, he invites us to the table. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh, of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. Jesus came down from heaven, fulfilling the promise of old. He came down, born of a virgin, he came down, son of man and son of God, son of man to bear our sins and to nail them on the cross, son of God to give you righteousness, to impute righteousness into us so we can stand before the Father on that day and be welcomed into heaven. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. Some said, this is a hard teaching. The spirit gives life, and the flesh counts for nothing. Jesus said, the words I have spoken, they are full of the spirit and life. You know, at that point, many turned away back then. And sad to say, many turn away today. But I think those of us who have the heart of Simon Peter, and Jesus asks the 12, you do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Come and partake. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for reigning on high. And your Son is at your right hand right now. And we thank you that you sent your Son to set us free from our sins. And you've planned it from the beginning. Because you know we were all born with that sinful nature from Adam's fall. And oh, so many times we stray away. 
And indeed, we could be like that woman at the well or the prodigal son. But we thank you like the blind man whose eyes were open. Who worshiped Jesus. And like the woman at the well who ran around declaring the good news. The good news. Free from sin. And our ticket punched for heaven. But we have to choose to do so. You stand at the door and knock. God, for those of us who have strayed, help us to open that door. For those who have never opened the door, help them to open the door today. As we break the bread and drink of the cup, Help us to remember what you did on the cross, your son. For it is in his name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Let's go ahead and dismiss uh, Teen and Junior Church. I have a couple of things I want to talk about before we get started with the sermon. I want to share a praise with you first of all. Uh, Ray Han Strider has been uh, struggling with um, a problem with his ankle for a little while. I mean, I don't know if it was five or six weeks ago, he even showed up at church. He was on crutches. It hurt really bad. Uh, he was talking to me about how difficult he had had that week beforehand, getting around in his house, just doing everyday things. Uh, and stuff, and he's gone to see the doctor, and he's done some of the things he's supposed to be doing with that, and um, today he's walked in here on his own power. He's feeling pretty good. Seems like everything is taken care of, so we just want to praise God for getting in there. He does have uh, arthritis, and uh, like we all tend to get sooner or later, um, but the, the immediate issue that was happening is gone, and so we just want to lift up God and in praise and thanks for that. And, uh, and then unfortunately, <laughs> I, I need to switch tacks and go to the other side of the fence. Um, Lisa Steiner passed away last night. It's been a hard two or three weeks. Jim went to the hospital three weeks ago with some heart issues and was in there, I think, three days and when he came home, Lisa was in a diabetic coma. And so then she's been in the hospital for most of that time. And then last week, um, they moved her to hospice. And uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before she requested to be taken off the die. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the word's not going to come to my mouth. Thank you. The dialysis machine and, and a couple of other issues. Um, and it uh, didn't take long for God to sweep her up and bring her home. So what I'm, I would like you to do is to be lifting up Jim, her husband, in your prayers. And, and, and I'm begging and pleading with you, get out of your comfort zones and reach out to him. Do whatever it takes to draw him out of the hole that this is going to be tempting for him to dive into. And let's love on him and let's take care of him in the wake of this loss. I say that <laughs> in light of what the message is going to be this morning. And I don't know if you've noticed while well, you've been here so far this morning, but God's bringing lines together that he's been drawing towards each other. And he's been doing things in the congregation. And he's been putting people together in a way that I haven't seen in a little while. So I got nothing I can do but go forward with the message he's put in my heart to preach in the first place. And i got to trust that he's going to do something with that for us about this issue. So this morning what we're doing is we're starting a series for Easter, which I have called The Demise of Death. And we're going to be talking about death in order to talk about resurrection. And so if it's rough this morning, I beg you to bear with God through all of this because I believe he's got something powerful he's going to do with you and I. And I know this season we usually focus on resurrection, but I really want us to spend more time focused on death this year in this season. Uh, it's not our favorite thing, and I understand that. I think all of us understand it's our enemy in one way or another, some of us directly because we resist it and fight it with everything we've got. Others of us, we put it off to the side or we try to ignore it or hide from it. And many of us don't like to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. But here's the thing. Our appreciation of and the strength of our hope in resurrection is severely diminished if we don't have a good understanding of death. If we are not willing to look death in the eye and let it know we're not afraid of it and we don't like it, we don't care for it one bit. And so if we really want to celebrate the joy of resurrection, we first need to look death in the eye and lament over it a little bit. Recognize it for what it is. We need to acknowledge that it has power to cause us pain it has power to separate us from those we love, some for a while and some permanently. We need to know that it's okay to be sad, that it's okay to be to grieve, to lament. 
We need to acknowledge that it has all of this power that makes our life difficult. And, and, and we need to understand that grieving is healthy. Crying is healthy. Being sad is healthy at a moment like that. Our modern world has kind of lost the will and the ability to do those things, to, to really lament. I think we've lost even the understanding that lamentation is important. And so we don't. We, we cry a little bit, and, and we try to push the bad stuff away as much as we can. And we would rather celebrate and party than face the pain of death. We want to hear good news. We don't want to hear the bad news if we can avoid it, right? We just give us the silver lining part. Just, I, I want the resurrection part without the cross part. I don't want to go there. And the problem with that is when you do your best to minimize death in this way and avoid lamenting and, and sorrow, you also minimize the resurrection and the celebration that comes with it. We minimize also in the process what Jesus has accomplished by defeating death at the cross. If we won't let in the full comprehension of how bad death is, how, and, and allow ourselves to experience the grief and the pain that it brings to us, then we're never going to understand fully, correctly, how joyous and precious resurrection is. As a matter of fact, for some of us, it will make it very difficult to even believe in resurrection if we're not willing to face death, if we're not willing to look it in the eye and see the truth about it, see it for what it is, and stand opposed to it. We have to truly comprehend, to truly comprehend the good news, we have to comprehend the bad stuff in all of its depth and frustration. Uh, we like to pretend death's not so bad. We like to pretend, well, it's not going to come for me like it did for that guy, even though I'm doing the same exact behavior that that guy was doing that took him to his death. We've got lots of medical advancements, and they're a good thing. And some, we haven't been able to cure death, but sometimes we can push it back. But I think in the process, especially in the Western world, that's kind of put us in this frame of mind about how we think about death. You know, out of sight, out of mind, I just pushed it back for five years. So I don't have to think about it for five years, you know. In 2007, I had that heart attack. I came out, and the cholesterol levels and everything was good. It was almost like being starting over. It's like, you know, it's going to be a while before I might have to deal with this again. So it's out of sight, out of mind. I don't worry about it. You move on, right? That's what we like to do. Sometimes we tell ourselves that death at 100 is less tragic than death at 25. You remember hearing that before? But here's the reality. It is tragic that anybody has to die at all. That's tragic. Sometimes we can't even say the word. We just want to avoid the reality of it. So we say things, and, and, and you probably heard me say it when I was talking about Lisa, one of these things. We, he's gone on to meet his maker. She's passed away. They're no longer with us. We say euphemisms like that rather than even just saying the word death or die. But we can't celebrate the joy of resurrection without being able to understand the full depth of death. To be able, without being able to lament the pain of it and just how bad it really is. It's really important that we allow ourselves to feel the sorrow. I don't mean be overwhelmed by it to the point of you're, you can't function in life anymore, but to at least feel the bite and the pain, the loss. It's really important that our faith be allowed to lament and express grief because God put those, thing, those things there for a reason. And we need to do them. It's really important that our faith be allowed to do that. It's really important to be reminded that this isn't the way that God wanted things to be. This isn't how he set it up. And Christianity gives us plenty of room and reason to express our frustration with all of the things that sin has brought down upon us, including death. And so I want us to remind ourselves how precious and joyous the resurrection that we've been promised is, that we're looking forward to is, by taking a look uh, at a passage of scripture where God has promised death's demise. So we're going to go back 700 years before Jesus has been brought to earth to the book of Isaiah. And we're going to read out of chapter 25 this morning. And we're going to start with the, the first three verses here. O oh Lord, you are my God, and I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified, fortified city of ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you and cities of ruthless nations will fear you. 
Isaiah prophesy, gives, delivers this prophecy and a bunch of others through his book just before a period of death and destruction that comes to Israel. It comes to Israel because of their consistent failure to live faithfully to God, to keep the commandments that they agreed to keep. So you can imagine, if you've not read through the book of Isaiah before, a lot of the things that Isaiah has to say come across as negative, or at least that's how we perceive them, that's how we think of them. Most of the people in, in Isaiah's day, they put up resistance the whole time that he was prophesying and preaching. They didn't want to hear it. And most of us, we don't read the book of Isaiah today because we don't want to hear it. We don't want to look at death. We don't want to look at what sin has wrought on us. We don't want to look at any of it. But I'm telling you, we got to do it. we got to face this stuff. And, and this particular one starts out really positive, doesn't it? First, Isaiah states that God is faithful and reliable at keeping his promises. And, and this whole year so far, haven't we talked about a number of promises that God has made to us? And Isaiah here is telling us that's a good thing for us to know then because guess what? He's faithful to keep them. And yes, there are consequences for Israel that are coming around the corner here for Israel, but God has promised a couple of things here in this first three verses to bring down the ruthless, to bring down their oppressors, and the fact that, that he's done it time and again before this point lets them know that when the time's right, he'll do it again. He'll do it again. And in the end, God's going to take care of his people. He's going to rescue his people from what he's allowed them to, to be taken up in, and he will bless them beyond belief. And so, yeah, there's going to be rough times. There's going to be difficulties we got to plow through. God's going to allow his people to suffer through things that are no fun. Sometimes he's going to allow us to suffer to the point of death. But as we'll see in a little while, that really doesn't matter. Death's no greater than any of the other things we have to deal with. No matter how big or how powerful or how scary the things that stand against us, the things that oppose us are, God will eventually bring them down, church, all of them, every single one of them that stands opposed to us. And on the other side of all of this difficulty and all of this suffering and all of the hard times we have to go through, God's got a pile of awesome promises waiting for us, and it'll be more than worth it. It'll be more than worth all of the garbage we had to go through to get there. But in order for Israel in that day and in order for us in this day to truly have a hope in that future, to be able to look forward to it and rely on it, we have to understand the weight of the oppression of our enemies, the weight of the difficult things they bring both then and now, the weight that death brings. We have to understand how truly powerless we are to stop it on our own and how badly we need God's help. And in this passage, Isaiah expresses his understanding of this and how he trusts God to get through it all. God's not offering us pie in the sky in this life. That's not the promise. That's coming later, and it's going to be worth it. But to get through all of this, we've, now we've got to trust God and turn and face the reality of what's happening to us, what sin has done to us, and do our part to make it through, not just alone, not just so I make it through, but so we all make it through together. And if we understand the gravity of the stuff we face, of the difficulties that lie before us, then the promise of better times later becomes the hope we truly can hang our hat on, that we can count on, that we can rely on, and it will get us home. Because as bad as things are and can get in this world, God is better than you can possibly imagine, no matter where we're talking about. God will rescue us, church, and not the way the world wants, though, sometimes not the way we want, because sometimes we line up what we want with how the world wants it. But he will do it the way that that's the best. And so Isaiah challenges us to trust our Father in heaven through the pain, through the difficulties, through the suffering, and as we will see in a few moments, even through death. So let's look at verses 4 and 5. These are truths about God in this passage that we can rely on that we can use to get through the difficult things. And so here's what he says in verses 4 and 5. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against the wall, like heat in a dry place. And you subdue 
talking about God, you subdue the noise of foreigners as heat by shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. A lot of metaphors in here to describe enemies and to describe what they can do and to describe what God can do. Most of them are not the way we would say them if we were writing today, trying to put this stuff down that God had put in our hearts. But I think we can understand the storm metaphor, right? We've, we've probably all experienced a moment in our lives where it just feels like a hundred things are coming at us at once, are happening to us at once. We're being spun around in a, like a tornado, and the wind slams us up against the wall and pins us there, and we feel like we can't get off, and now we've got thunder booming at us and lightning blinding us with every three-second pass, passage of time. And no matter what we try to do to get off that wall, it just feels like we're fighting everything, and we can't move, and we're not going to get free. It's so difficult and so trying. Have you had that experience in your life? Have you ever had to struggle like that where it just seemed like there's no way I'm going to get through this? That's how many of our enemies are. That's how life can be sometimes for us. It comes and goes in waves like that. And there are moments like this when we need to to face them and acknowledge just how rough it is. Just how bad it hurts. How frustrating it is to go through it and how helpless we feel and conversely, how badly we need, to, we need to get God's help, get him to step in and, and help us get through it put, it, put it to bed so that we don't have to deal with it anymore. You know, I, and, and it's hard for us to do this, and sometimes I hear Christians saying things that make the rest of us feel guilty when we do start feeling uh, sorrow, when we do start feeling frustration, when we do start feeling the pain uh, of the bite of sin, and they'll say things like, well, Christians shouldn't cry and feel sorrow or be upset when a sister or brother dies because they're in heaven with Jesus now, or we don't get to complain because God's already won, you know? He's already won. We just got to get through a few more skirmishes. And I hate that. That's such a lie to tell us we, don't, we, don't, we shouldn't do those things. I want to encourage you this morning to go ahead and express and complain the complaints that you have about the difficult stuff. I don't mean be a whiny butt, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. A guy that's just chronically complaining about everything all the time and doesn't try to do anything about it. But there's nothing wrong with expressing the reality of what you're dealing with. That's the first step in being able to deal with it is to be able to say, I understand it, actually, what's going on here. I understand how bad it is. So go ahead and cry for those who have died. Well, if we're Christians, we know where they went, and we know we're going to see them again. But you know what? They've been taken from us for a time period, and usually not through a fun way. It hurts. And there is loss. It's not a permanent loss, maybe, but there's loss, and it hurts. And we should be able to cry over it. Why did God give us tears? You know, and while the end result that God has for us is set in stone and it's going to be better than we can imagine, the experience that sin puts us through in the meantime is is real and it's hard. And death, even though it's temporary, is still heartbreaking. It's still heartbreaking. You know, my dad and I, we weren't always the best of pals. But I hate that he's gone and that I can't continue to try and work on that relationship with him. It's frustrating that I didn't get to be able to work with him until we got it to a great place. But I know it's going to be a really great place when I get up to where he is now. But in the meantime, I miss him. And that's okay. Death is temporary, but it's still heartbreaking, church. Because it wasn't supposed to be this way. It wasn't supposed to be this way, but here it is. And in a sense, when we lament about death and about some of these other things we have to deal with, we're really lamenting about Adam's bad choice. I know Eve took the fruit first and ate of it, and she turned and offered it to him. At that point, he could have changed the scenario from what it wound up being. But he didn't. He chose to go forward with what she did. And he has created a story arc of sin that we all have to go through now when God had so much something so much better planned. That hurts. It's really disappointing, and it's okay to express that. It's okay to feel that. And I want you to notice what Isaiah says, that God is for us in light of that information. He's a stronghold to those in distress. He's a shelter to get out of the storm. He's a shade of relief from the heat. You know, when I was youth minister, we used to go to Honduras and and take young people on mission trips. And I'm telling you what, Every time we went, it was so much hotter there than it ever gets here. I mean, every once in a while we break 100 and and stuff, but I'm telling you what, (laughs) 
90s and 100 was just the bottom for them. There was one trip we went on, it broke 120 every single day we were there. And I'm telling you what, the difference between being in the sun and being in the shade in an environment like that is enormous. We would, there was a thing we were working on that, that year, and, and it was out in the open. They cut all the trees around it down, and there was absolutely no shade. <laughs> And we're digging ditches, and we're pouring cement, and we're, we're laying brick or stone wall and so forth. And, and it was just killer. Every 20 minutes, we'd have to take a break and go in the shade. And then we started figuring out what things could we do with this job in the shade, because it felt so much better over there, we were able to get some things done. So we mixed the cement in the shade, <laughs> and then hauled it over to the ditches where we needed to pour the footers. It was such a big difference. It was such a big difference. Relief. It's what God is offering. Relief is what God is for us, church. And that's what we need sometimes is relief. And there's no shame in expressing our need for relief. There's nothing wrong with us when we find things difficult to bear or to deal with. Longing for relief is good and right, because shouldn't we be longing for the Lord anyway? Yeah. Not only do we need relief, but God is promising it to us, church promising us relief from the circumstances that hold us down, relief from those who oppress us, relief from the suffering of sickness. If, if we're not willing to or, or able to admit or express how bad things hurt sometimes and how oppressive things are sometimes, how difficult they can be, we will have difficulty trusting the Lord for relief. And then you know what we do? We, we just keep on trying to find it our own way, failing time and again. God is the one who can put down our enemies and bring us relief. God is the one. He's the one who has a stronghold for us. He's the one who provides shelter and shade from some of these difficulties when we need them. He's the one who can shut the mouths of our enemies and bring an end to their plans, not just temporarily, but but permanently, eventually. Let's look at verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow and aged wine well-refined, the mountain that, Jesus, that, that God has brought up here in this prophecy represents things that we are familiar with in the New Testament as New Jerusalem or the second heaven and second earth. It's the place where God is calling his people to from every tongue and tribe and nation to the, into the next life. And guess what's going to happen after we've gone through this difficult life and we get to that mountain, we arrive. We're going to celebrate like we've never celebrated before. That's the time to celebrate. That's the time to celebrate, church. This is what Jesus was talking about in the Gospels as well as in Revelation 19 when he's talking about the wedding feast to come. That time when we finally got relief from all the impact of sin and we are together and we are partying and partying and partying over it and being with God. And as to what the whole thing will be like, how awesome it is, I want you to think in terms of what Jesus did at the wedding banquet at Cana. You remember how the, they ran out of wine? And the way they usually did it was that they, they, they did the, the best wine first, and then they'd bring in the cheap wine and they'd water it down for the rest of the evening. I mean, they were, some of them are a little too inebriated to notice the difference anymore, and so that's how they would handle it. And what happened was the guy throwing the feast got praised for bringing the best wine that they ever had in their life at the end. That's what it's going to be like. The wine that he provided, that Jesus provided, is a metaphor for how much better it will be for us when we arrive on the mountain and we celebrate what God has done for us and where we are now. And the norm, the norm from that point on, all the suffering that we've gone through, all of the difficulty we've dealt with, the norm from that point on will be God's way of living. It will be natural for us. It will be the default mode for us. And God's blessings will be on us. The fulfillment of his promises will be all about that. From that point forward, living itself will be a celebration. And so every day, we will celebrate life. We will celebrate being with the Lord. The things we struggled through and cried over before, they'll be gone. They'll be gone. And I mean gone, gone. Not around the corner gone. Not put under the carpet gone. But gone. He'll do away with everything that sin has brought down on us. Evil, hatred, hunger, sickness, poverty, all of it, gone. That's what God has promised. That's what's prom- what he's promising in this passage in Isaiah. And that's what we've seen uh, in, in some of the sermons that we've been doing lately. It's what we've seen. It's starting to be put into place 
on the day of Pentecost, isn't it? The, the foundations for this celebration on the mountain, right? After Jesus has been crucified and resurrected and has ascended into heaven, we see first the apostles and then others taking God's offer of forgiveness and citizenship and his family and eternal life to first the Jews and then to all people. And that's the gathering that we've talked about that's already begun, right? That's beginning to happen. The assembly on the mountain that's being talked about here is the gathering we've been talking about in the book of Acts that has already begun and is working its way towards completion even now. Even now. But we have to be patient, church. We have to be able to endure some difficult things for a while longer in order to get to the good things that have been promised. Because they're not for now, some of them are for later. The process has started in the time of the apostles, just as Isaiah prophesied that it would. And it is continuing in our time, but it's not yet completed, and so we know what we're doing, right? We're still looking forward to some things. We're still hanging on for some things. We're still putting our hope in those things, our arrival in heaven. We're still looking forward to the celebration that's talked about in this passage. We're looking forward to that moment when we can finally stand together and say, God did win, just like he said he was going to win. We could say, uh, it's over. The pain, it's gone. My new body, I just feel like I've never felt in my entire life. We could say all of the oppression is over and all of the injustice is over and we're free and we're with God at last. Amen? Amen. And you know what? We don't have to wait till then to celebrate, church. Every time we get together, it doesn't matter whether we're here on Sunday morning or whether we're getting together in one another's houses or we're going out to a hockey game together like we did last night. Do you know what that should be? That should be a time where we are anticipating this day of arrival and freedom and, and celebration. When we come together at the communion table, should be a moment for us to be looking forward to that day. And let's celebrate a little bit this morning. Amen. Amen. We should be celebrating that the pain and the tears and the sorrow will be gone. They will be gone. It will have been worth it. But I want us to hold on here because while all those things will be done away with, he's got one more to talk about. In verses 7, it will two more to talk about in verses 7 and 8. Here's what it says, and he will swallow up on this mountain. That means when we get there, when we get there, he's going to take fair, care of things, right? He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. The promises in this passage includes the removal of a veil, it says, it was put upon us when Adam chose to eat from that tree, okay? It, it, it was uh, his action tainted us all with sin, right? And it doomed us all to have to experience death. And at that moment, it doomed us all to death unless God did something about it for us, which we all know he did through Jesus, amen? Amen. This veil of separation is a space that God had to put between us and him because of our sin. Paul talks about it, uh, about the veil and how it limits us in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm sure you've heard it before. Now I see through a glass darkly, but then uh, at the resurrection I shall see clearly. Now I understand limitedly, but then I shall understand fully. That's the veil. That's the difference the veil is making. And God is promising that in the end, this veil will be removed from all of his people. We will be removed from, from all of that nonsense. We will be able to see him face to face. We will be able to live with him. And that should, that should excite us because you remember Nexus 33? Moses asked God, can I see you? And God wanted to let him do it, but because of the stain of sin, he could only allow him to see his back through a veil. Put his hand over the crack in the rock that he stuffed Moses into. And then he just kind of spread him a little bit just so he could get a peek. That's that veil. The other limitation that sin has put on us, upon us has to do with our bodies. From the day that we are born, we start to die. 
coming through the birth canal of your mother's body, your cells are rubbing against her cells and some of them are dying as you come out. As time passes, our bodies, they get weak. They are susceptible to sickness and disease, some of us sooner than others, but they all wear out. But in heaven, our bodies will be renewed. We already know that from other places in Scripture, and they will be like Adam and Eve's bodies were before they chose to sin, when everything functioned the way that it was supposed to. The other... Well... Let's just move on. So that brings us to God's promise to do away with our final enemy. That's how he refers to it sometimes, and that's death. Death, he says, will be undone and cast into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Death's ability to separate us, death's ability to hurt us, death's ability to take from us, death's ability to hold it onto us, it'll all be undone, and then it will be destroyed so that it can never be something we have to deal again, so that we will never be within its grasp again. And I can't wait for that. Lisa's already beginning to enjoy the beginnings of what that feels like. She's at rest in Abraham's bosom waiting for the same thing that we're eager to get to, and that's that, that's that wedding banquet. I love the use of the words... Uh, swallow up that Isaiah uses here. He's using it to um, describe what God will do to death. But you know what? I think it's a good description of what death does to our loved ones. Isn't it? Swallow. It swallows them up and they're gone from us. And I also think it's a good description of what grief can do to those of us who are left behind. Our grief, our sense of loss at losing a dearly loved one can swallow us up. And so as we allow ourselves to have grief and we allow ourselves to experience tears and sadness and sorrow, we need to be careful that we don't allow it to swallow us up. We definitely need to allow for those things to happen, for us to go through that process of grieving. Allow the tears, feel the loss, but let us do so remembering the promise that our enemies and their, opposite, their oppression and, their, and the sin that, and death that has so destroyed us will come to a bad end. It'll come to a bad end, and we will be reunited with those loved ones who belong to Jesus, and we will live on in bliss. And again, we, i got to underscore this one more time. Allowing the grief and the sorrow and the tears is not unchristian, church. It's not unchristian. It isn't a sign of weakness. It is an understanding of reality and a reason to hang on to God's promises all the more firmly, all the more tightly. It's an acknowledgement of just how bad death is. It's an acknowledgement of how much it hurts to have to deal with it, how offensive that it is, that it even exists because it wasn't supposed to. I would even say that we have a right to be angry at death. In any case, all, this is, all of this stuff that we must allow it to happen to us in order to understand how magnificent resurrection is going to be and how vindicating the demise of death is going to be God will swallow up the one who has been swallowing up his people, and it will be no more. Death will be dead itself. That's a statement I can't wait to hear God say with finality as he throws it into the lake of fire. Imagine what it's going to be like, right? We face death, the death of loved ones, over and over through our life. Finally, we have to pass through that door ourselves. And then, as God has promised in an imitation of our big brother Jesus... We find ourselves alive again in bodies that are missing all of the veil that was laid on them. All the pain and the sorrow and the poverty and the sickness and, and the war and the hatred that we've had to deal with, the effects of it are not there anymore. And it's amazing. There standing before us face to face is our rescuer, our redeemer, our stronghold, our shelter, the one who has loved us with a love that no one else has even come close to, our God and Father, welcoming us into the joy of his presence. I knew I was going to get here and have trouble with it, with those words of praise that he promises. Well done. Well done. I long to hear that so badly. From him, 
as I have worked and trudged through all of the difficulty of this life, all the temptation, all the times that I failed, like, like, like Dave was talking about earlier in his meditation, we, we struggle and we feel so unworthy and we just screw up all the time, it seems like. And to be able to get up there and have him say, well done, all because we accepted what Jesus has offered for us, I can't wait to hear it. And then we're going to stand there and we're going to watch as he tosses the devil and his angels and sin and death into the lake of fire, never to be seen, seen or heard from again, never to touch us again, never to affect us again, probably even to be wiped from our memories for all we know. So that there won't even be fret in the future over the past. And then he's going to wipe away our tears, the passage says, and the righteousness of Jesus will be applied to us. And it says our shame and our reproach will be taken away. It'll be taken away. And then we will celebrate. Then we will celebrate. And we'll celebrate with all of our brothers and sisters who have already gone before us. They'll all be there. And so, brothers and sisters, we've never met. And it's going to be something. The Apostle John confirms all of this stuff in the book of Revelation. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that you've read it, read, or at least read parts of it. We don't have time to focus on a lot of it, but I want to focus on uh, chapter 21, the first four verses. This is what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be, the, be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things, the world of sin, have passed away. So here's something to think about as we start winding this up. For God to wipe away your tears, church, <laughs> you've got to have some. You've got to have some, and you have to be willing to give them to the Lord so that he can wipe them away. You can't have them and keep them to yourself. And, and we need to understand why, because God knows just how bad death and grief and pain and mourning and sorrow are. Because he experienced them all himself in the form of Jesus. If you doubt that we ought to be in touch with our grief and our pain and have anger over, that, over what death is doing to us, then I suggest you take a look in John chapter 11. When Jesus shows up to raise his friend Lazarus from the, de from the dead, this is what he's about to do. <laughs> but because the man had to go through death... It brings Jesus to tears. If God can have pain and sorrow and grief over death, then so can we. It's good and it's healthy for us to express uh, all of this frustration and, and hurt and anger that we have over what death does to us and what sin does to us. This wasn't how it was supposed to be and he finds that just as frustrating that it had to be this way, as you and I do. But it's not how it's going to stay. That's the good news. It's not how it's going to stay. This all requires something from us, though, church. This requires trust in God. And sometimes we struggle with that because of the limitations of that veil, right? Because of the taint of sin on us. But, but I tell you, I'm telling you, look at Jesus and use him for your example and keep following him. Don't turn away to the right or the left and find someone else to follow, even temporarily. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Isn't that what we were using for our, our theme last year? Jesus front and center. Keep your eyes right on him. Because that's how we're going to get through this. God promised to defeat death, and he has done it. But the full removal of it is not here yet. It's a two-stage process for you and I. Upon Jesus' resurrection, we have proof that the promise is going to come true and we too will be resurrected. Jesus wasn't resurrected as God only. He was resurrected in a human form so God can resurrect human beings, you see. He's the proof 
that the promise is going to come to pass. But for us, uh, while, that, while that, that rendered, this has rendered death impotent, it's not destroyed death yet. Okay? And so we've got some things we've got to go through. But its demise has been set in stone. It's time to end has been set in stone, and it's coming. And it's not that we won't have to experience it. There will be a few of us that will be fortunate at the time that Jesus returns who are living that won't have to, but the rest of us, we're still going to have to experience it, but it's not going to be able to hold on to us just like it couldn't hold on to Jesus. It becomes now a doorway through which we have to pass from this life to the next. And then as we have already talked about, it will, it will be swallowed up and it will be thrown into the lake of fire. And I can hardly wait for it. I can hardly wait for it. I got some days where I just shed tears over what Jesus has done for us and, and I want to get there now. <laughs> and he's got to remind me, no, you got stuff to do. I guess that's why he sent me to the hospital and got me that double bypass because he's still got things for me to do. But in the meantime, I will have moments when I'm going to shed tears and I'm going to express my disdain for what we have to go through. And I'm going to fight against sin and against death and against all my oppressors the way that God is leading me to do. And I will fall on him for the help I need because he's the only one who can provide it. And I'm going to feel the fullness and understand the depth of what sin has wrought on me and on you. But I can't hardly wait to feel the depth and the fullness of the relief and the celebration, and my gratefulness coming, bursting forth out of my breast to God on the day of arrival in heaven before him. I keep that always before me, just like I try to keep Christ before me. And I can't wait to hear those words of welcome that we're all going to hear and get that party started. Let's have the worship team return to stage, please. I, I know this may have been a hard sermon for some of you, but there may be someone here who hasn't got this End result set in stone for them, the one where we get to go to the mountain of New Jerusalem and be with our Savior forever, and you don't have to miss out on it. If you've never turned your life over to God, let's not wait any longer. Let's get this done. Come forward this morning and, and, and accept Jesus as your Savior and repent of your sin and get baptized in his name. And I know there's some of us here who've done that, and we struggle <laughs> We struggle because that veil is like a wet blanket. And we're uncomfortable and it weighs us down and we can't see clearly through it. And so sometimes we get off track and we get messed up. And I invite you, if that's how you feel, to come forward this morning and let myself or one of the elders help you figure it out. How do we function under this veil? And how do we get back on track where we need to go? We can do that with you. We also invite you to come forward uh, if you're in need of other things like prayer, or like encouragement, or maybe you need someone to ask some questions further about Jesus, about God, about whatever we've been talking about in the last few weeks. Maybe you want to place your membership with us because you're coming from another church from some other place. Whatever it is, this morning is the time. Don't delay. Come.
So Brittany came up just to kind of share a little bit more about uh, what she's been dealing with. She's been dealing with, she got married a couple years ago, and um, this guy's turned out to be abusive physically, verbally, emotionally. Um, she's not with him at the moment. She's at home with her mom. And he continues, you know, she keeps trying. God's pulling lines together this morning. He's doing some stuff, and you've got, still got time. If you need to come forward and need to take care of something, don't let it linger. Let's do it today. In the meantime, I just want to remind you, we started into uh, Easter season and Resurrection Sunday, or for some of you, Easter Sunday is coming, and this is a good time to invite guests to join us. We've got the Easter breakfast that's going to happen 
uh, on that morning. And uh, invite your guests to that too. But make sure that you let us know what the number's going to be so that we provide the right amount of food. We've also got a Good Friday event that's going to happen just like we've had off and on, uh, except for COVID one year, the last couple of years. And uh, uh, Lori and crew are getting it together, and it's going to look, it's looking pretty good from where I've been standing so far looking over their shoulders. So uh, plan to be here for that as well. All those things are in the bulletin. There are extra flyers in, in the foyer if you need uh, to take some of those with you to invite friends and neighbors and family to join us. You're welcome to take them. Any of you gentlemen have anything that needs to be conveyed? Then I'm going to turn it over to you, brother. Bless us out of here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you took away death, the sting of death, by your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we do weep at times. It hurts. But we know, we know heaven is there. It's a fact. But until then, help us to persevere. And when we fall, pick us up. And you provide brothers and sisters to pick us up as well. Let us take their hands today and be faithful, faithful to you. Father, there's a world, there's a world out there that's hopeless. And they're scared to death of death. Help us to go and help them to face death head on. Help us to be faithful to you. Jesus, front and center. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. And I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in all of you. All God's people said, Amen. go and share.